Nothing But Truth now welcomes our good friend. He is back. That's right. We've missed him over the last month, but he has agreed to come back. I begged. I, I, I'm not too proud to beg. Absolutely not. I said, Jerry, please. Chairman of Boyer Re Research, and he is a Forbes contributor as well. Jerry Boyer, welcome back. Uh, great to be back. I've missed you too, Craig. Hey, uh, well, let's jump right in, shall okay. we? Why, why don't we start with President Obama speaking today about the sanctions and turning it up just a bit on Vladimir Putin after the Crimean annexation and what looks like to be building an invasion force for eastern Ukraine. Roll it. And because of these choices, uh, the United States is today moving, as we said we would, to impose additional costs on Russia. Based on the executive order that I signed in response to Russia's initial intervention in Ukraine, we're imposing sanctions on more senior officials of the Russian government. In addition, we are today sanctioning a number of other individuals with substantial resources and influence who provide material support to the Russian leadership. As well as a bank, I signed a new executive order today that gives us the authority to impose sanctions not just on individuals but on key sectors of the Russian economy. This is not our preferred outcome. These sanctions would not only have a significant impact on the Russian economy, but could also be disruptive to the global economy. The Russian people need to know, and Mr. Putin needs to understand, that the Ukrainians shouldn't have to choose between the West and Russia. We want the Ukrainian people to determine their own destiny. Jerry, your thoughts on not only the actions of Vladimir Putin, but our president's response. Well, it's interesting. Um, I, in my view, the actions of Putin and our president's response um, are closely related in that I think that uh, um, uh, Putin correctly anticipated the president's response. Um, in other words, um, you know, uh, um, Russia is not acting in a vacuum. They're acting in terms of their expectations of what we'll do. And I think uh, that uh, Putin rightly anticipated from the West in general, and particularly from the United States, a rather tepid response, um, which I think helped uh, him to make the decision to invade and then annex Crimea. Um, I think the invasion of Crimea um, was illegal. Uh, I think the annexation of Crimea was illegal. Um, because I think the, um, the the decision of Crimea to uh, leave Ukraine not using constitutional measures was illegal. Um, Crimea is legally part of Ukraine still. Um, so when you annex somebody's, uh, when you annex, uh, uh, you know, if, if Mexico annexed Texas, it wouldn't be legal just because they did it. Um, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that in the end there can't be an end game where if the Crimeans want to be Russians, they can be, you know, some kind of constitutional arrangement, but that's not what was done. This was done in a way that was very lawless. So, uh, you know, why why did Putin do this? I mean, I understand from his standpoint why he wants to. Um, and anyone who, who, who thinks that Putin's actions are shocking or surprising really isn't paying attention to Eastern European geopolitics or to, or to Russian politics. Uh, this intervention was fully um, to be expected. It's not a shocking intervention. Uh, Russia is acting in its national interest. We shouldn't walk through life imagining that no one will ever do anything mean or that everyone in the world will be nice just so long as we're nice to them, they'll be nice to us, and pretend that nations will not act in their national interest. But, Jerry, uh, this is the 21st century. Right. So, so I, I, I'm saying that, you know why I'm saying that, but I, I want you to explain that because there, there, the, this is a fundamental misunderstanding, not only with foreign policy, but also domestic policy. It's about human nature. Go ahead, my friend. Yes, we think we've abolished human nature, yeah. right? Um, mm -hmm. But the problem is, you know, they're talking about a 19th century view of the world. Well, okay, that's fine, but a the 19th century is actually a lot more peaceful than the 20th century. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> in the 20th century, we thought we could abolish war you know, by creating a League of Nations, we could abolish human nature. If we just say war is from now on illegal, and we'll all promise not to have any wars anymore, that that will get rid of war. 
the, the system of international relations works when everybody pursues their national interest and everyone's realistic about everybody else pursuing their national interest. If we don't think it's in the national interest of the United States for the United for the, for um, the Russian Republic to own half of Ukraine, then it's incumbent upon us to counter them in in numerous ways. We can talk about the tactics we can use to counter them, but instead, what we seem to be doing is instead of using countermeasures, we use strong rhetoric, uh, but really weak um, countermeasures. It's exactly the opposite of Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt said, "You speak softly and you carry a big stick." We're walking around spouting rhetoric about the law of the jungle and the dark path to uh, lonely isolation for Russia, and we're bringing out these um, these pencil thin uh, uh, um, punishments, um, sanctions against them that will affect maybe nobody. With all this overheated rhetoric and threatening language, it's exactly the opposite of the way that we should be acting. We should the rhetoric should be cool. But the uh, sanctions should be strong if, in fact, we want to punish them. But Putin knew that the sanctions would be weak, which is what made him bold, which is why he's annexed Crimea and may, may annex more of the Ukraine. I don't think he'll annex more than, um, than Ukrainian territory. I know there's a lot of talk about Estonia, Latvia, etc. I think that's all very unlikely because of their NATO membership. Um, um, you know, whether he'll pick up more of eastern Ukraine, well, that's, a, you know, that's more understandable. Um, but this happens because, not because of who Putin is, this happens because of who we are. If we send signals of weakness and national decline, we'll see more of this. We're seeing it, we'll see more of it. We'll see it in eastern Ukraine, we'll see it in the South China Sea, we'll see it every place that there are great powers who want to get back onto the world stage who've been held in, in check by our strength. Uh, if we are a declining economic superpower, our decline will not be a smooth one. You, we, they, the, the wolves will be yapping at our heels as we retreat from the world. Is freedom at the foundation of this and the lack of defense and understanding of what we stand for? You've talked about before the synergy, if you will, between, well, well Poland 81. You have Reagan, you have... Reagan, Thatcher, Thatcher the right. Pope, John Paul II. Yeah. Yes, and 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 making the moral case for freedom. President Obama, if, if we're looking for the bizarro Reagan, the exact opposite, he is. Has that created this vacuum? Oh, absolutely. Now, now we have um, Francis instead of John Paul II, mm -hmm. uh, a much more liberal Pope, a much a Pope who's much more given to saying things that are popular in the press. I mean, I don't mean to attack the religious leader of a people. I think, in many ways, I think Pope Francis is a wonderful man, but uh, he is not a John Paul II when it comes to moral clarity about, the, uh, about geopolitical power grabs. That's just not where he's coming from. That's just not what he's trying to do. I think he's trying to rebuild the public image. Um, you, have, um, yeah, you have Tories in power in in. Uh, in England, but you don't have Thatcher Tories. You have the Red Tories, you know, the, the compassionate conservatives. And in the United States, we have maybe our weakest um, president since James Buchanan. Uh, so, and I think, I think that, um, you know, Putin understands what he's dealing with. He understands that he's not uh, Gorbachev dealing with a Thatcher and a Reagan and a John Paul II. He's dealing with uh, a much less powerful triumvirate of uh, political and religious leaders, um, you know, in the West. And, he's, and it's not just a matter of moral strength and moral fiber and clarity. It's also a matter of our actual economic power. We're growing at, you know, one and a half, two percent. We're not growing at four uh, percent. We have a budget sequester, which is doing, which is causing very strong cutbacks in our military spending. So we are actually. It's not just that Obama doesn't have the strength of a Reagan. It's actually that we don't have the comparative economic strength in America that we had before. It really is a question whether we can afford to play the role that we used to, even if we had the moral strength to do it, because of our own poor domestic policies. See, domestic policy is what creates or, or destroys the economic strength, which we then um, use in foreign policy. If we are economically weak, and it's not just economics, it's also culture. If we're economically and culturally weak, then we will also be weak in foreign affairs by necessity. And that's the, that's the real meaning to me of the Book of Judges. 
Uh, if the people who are following God turn against him um, and weaken their culture, weaken their economy, weaken their society, he raises up tyrants, frequently from the East. It's throughout the history of Christendom. When we've been weak, God has always called forth or allowed tyrants from the East to come up and challenge us, to poke at us, to wake us from our slumber. So, you know, whether it's Genghis Khan from basically the same part of the world, this, who was called the scourge of God, who was seen as a judgment on God on a weak Christendom, or whether it's Vladimir Putin, kind of the new Genghis Khan. Um, this is an old pattern that, you know, that God uses to accomplish his higher purposes. Um, I'm not saying that God makes Putin do what he does. What I'm saying is, when, we're, when we, you know, what, what does Proverbs say? If a man's ways please the Lord, he causes even his enemies to be at peace with him. If we're pleasing to God and strong, we have, less, we have fewer challengers. If we become decadent culturally, economically, financially, and militarily, then we will just get more and more and more challenges. The answer is to repent and go back and become that strong nation again so that we don't have to have tough rhetoric. We're strong enough that everyone's afraid to challenge us. It's interesting because what you've just done, as you said, it's not about necessarily the rhetoric in itself. It's about the foundation of where we're coming from domestically and what we've become as a society. And from day one, you've spoken to a cultural element. Not only a cultural element, you've said that's the foundation of changing and we're seeing it reflected domestically as well as how it, you just explained. It's uh, reflected in our foreign policy, that being one of projecting weakness. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just point to one cultural, spiritual factor that I think is really important now. Because Americans have moved from Christ worship to nature worship, mm -hmm. um, and we haven't used the resources that we have, say the natural gas and oil resources that we have, um, you know, because Hollywood tells us that fracking yes. will, I don't know, turn your tap water on 40 fire seconds. Yes, because Because we become Gaia worshippers. Um, uh, powers like Russia, which are carbon powers, petrocarbon powers, are much more powerful than they would be otherwise. Listen, oil shouldn't be $90 a barrel. It should be $40 a barrel. And if we weren't nature worshippers, it would be. Natural gas would be $3 per million BTUs in, in, uh, in the West, not $14. And Vladimir Putin would be making money as a part-time judo instructor because he wouldn't be able to afford to invade other nations because they wouldn't have the revenues because we'd be producing the natural gas the world needs. That might be the quote to introduce the clip because I'm posting this big time on the tomorrow, fear not. Jerry Boyer, great to be back with you. God bless, my friend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Crane Durham.